Composition. In this lecture, we're going to have a look at how you organize things in your photo just so that it feels more balanced or complete. So we're going to have a look at my top 10 composition tips, starting with what you think would be an obvious one, try to make sure your horizons are horizontal, but some people just have an inability to hold the camera square and every single photo they take is just a little bit wonky. Sometimes they say, oh, it doesn't matter, it's digital. Surely we can just rotate it and crop it later on. But you'd be surprised how much you lose in a picture when you rotate it and crop it. Just because it was all in there when it was wonky doesn't mean it'll be all in there or look any good by the time you've cropped it. You lose huge wedges off every corner. You also lose quality on your image. Obviously photos are horizontal and vertical rows of pixels. And if you have to rotate it a little bit and then save it back into horizontal and vertical rows, of course some pixels get smeared from here to here and you just lose a bit of clarity. So you're better off getting it right in shot. My best technique for that is really just look for something that's supposed to be horizontal like a horizon and then try and just check that it's parallel with the bottom of your viewfinder. Just match it up just to check it's parallel. Or a building that's supposed to be vertical, just check it matches up with the side of your viewfinder. A lot of cameras these days have that inbuilt digital level, which is handy as well. But the main thing is just spend a couple of seconds to make sure your photo is square, because it ruins a lot of photos and you don't want to have to try and fix it later. Rule of thirds. You've probably heard of this one before. It's a pretty important composition rule. It's basically saying that, yeah, here's a nice enough photo of a hiker walking along a beach, but for some reason, this just feels a little bit nicer. It's a little more balanced. It's hard to work out exactly why. But in its simplest form, the rule of thirds is saying, try not to just put your subject slap bang in the middle of the photo, as tempting as it is. It normally looks nicer if you can deliberately put your subject off on the side. Give it some space in front of it. Now what's actually going on here is the rule of thirds. That's just where, in your head, you mentally divide your viewfinder up into these vertical and horizontal thirds, and just trying to range as much as you can of your photo around those lines. So if you've got a strong horizon, you might put that on the bottom third or the top third, depending on which bit of the photo needed more space. Or if you're putting your subject off to the side, you might move them off to this third or the other third. Another example here, see it's just in the middle, it doesn't look that exciting. It just looks a whole lot nicer when you pull it off to the side. In fact, where those third lines intersect, there's four points in a photo there. If you can put the key bit of your image, either your subject, or the key bit of your subject, on those intersection points, that's a really powerful point in the photo and it looks really good. Sometimes you can have a bit of a dilemma as to which side of the photo do you put your subject on, which third. And you can just try and remember it as always try and give your subjects room to move into or see into. You know, if they're looking or moving in a direction, no one cares about what's behind them, what's been and gone. They want to see forward. So you crop out all the stuff behind them, give them extra space in front. Some people call that nose room. You know, you're just giving space in front of things. That's the same thing as rule of thirds. Of course, we all have a bit of a problem now because in the previous lecture, we all went and put our center autofocus point on so the camera was only gonna focus what's in the dead center of the shot. And now here I am saying, oh, but it looks so much better if you put your penguin off on one third. Now, what that does mean is you do point directly at your subject, first of all, while you're focusing, beep, and then after it's found that focus lock, keep your finger half pressed, and then you can reframe the shot and put your penguin off on the third or whatever you want for good composition before you depress the button all the way down to get the shot. Obviously, otherwise, if you start off with your penguin off on the side and you try and half press to focus, it's just gonna focus on the sky behind the penguin and you end up with a blurry subject. So you point directly at your subject to start with. Ideally, you focus on its eye. Actually, that's a good side tip. If you're ever photographing a person or an animal and you can see their eye in the shot, that's where you've got to focus on. That's the important part that has to be sharp. So here you'd just be focusing on the, the eye of the penguin, half press, beep, until it gets a focus. Then you keep your finger half pressed while you reframe to the side, rule of thirds, and then you depress the button all the way. Perfect. So there you go, that's how you use that center autofocus point to allow you to focus on exactly what you want in your image, but you can still then recompose and put it wherever you want in the photo before you take the shot. That's why you have that AFS or single shot focus rather than the tracking system. I think about the only exception to the rule of thirds are reflection photos where you don't feel like you have to put that horizontal division uh, on the top or bottom third because the symmetry of what's going on is what makes those photos beautiful anyway. But I think in the, in the vertical plane it still, still applies. But the key part of the photo where your eye is drawn to is obviously that tree fern. So that's in the top third corner and bottom third corner. It kind of balances it out, vaguely still fitting the rule of thirds. So try and imagine this is a view at the back of a boat that you're on and you're trying to get a nice you know, postcard shot of this bird and the sunset and things like that using the rule of thirds. Have a think in your head how you might frame that up. Hopefully you're thinking something along the lines of that. You can see your horizon is obviously your strong bottom third. The clouds make the top third line. There's our little bird, he's the subject. 
he's moving into the shot. So we wanna give him space to move into. So we move him off to that right hand third. But then you have some people jump up and down and say, oh, but you missed the lovely golden lighting over there and the blue sky up the top, what about that? And it just goes to show that the world doesn't always fit into nine magic boxes. And you've often got to make a call between good composition and trying to fit everything in. And I really think it's always important to try and have good composition. People don't know what they're missing if you don't include it in the photo, but what you include, it's got to look nice. Framing is another good tip. This is good for your landscape photos particularly. Framing is when you deliberately include something up close in your photo. It tends to make it seem a bit more 3D, it gives it a lot more depth. It also stops your eye falling off the edge of the photo. You kind of frame it or hem it in by putting something along the edges and the sides. Look at this example here. This is taken in Papua New Guinea. You can see some nice volcanoes puffing away, but it does look a little bit flat compared to this one, which just has so much more depth to it. And that's because I've deliberately got some close up foreground elements there. As you can see, it also tends to pull our attention back towards the middle of the photo again. It stops your eye just slipping off the edge. And you probably have to admit that a lot of people make this mistake with their landscape shots where you know you get to a lookout and the first thing you do is you get everyone out of the way and if there's a fence there you've got to get over the fence because that's in the way and if there's a tree you know you, you almost fall off the edge of the cliff trying to get away from the tree to cut that out and you go to these great lengths to get an unobstructed view of the distant mountains but then the problem is everything in your photo is a million miles away and it just looks flat you're better off crouching down and trying to find a, a tussock of grass that you can pop up into that corner or if there's a tree there great Use that frame half you shot off with that. Same with this example, the sunset. Not a particularly good photo, but it was a nice sunset. But there was this stupid tree that kept on putting branches in the left-hand side of the shot, and I had to keep on edging off to the right. I almost fell off the balcony trying to get a clear view of the sky until it finally dawned on me that it's probably nicer to let that tree come into the shot. So it frames off that side of the shot, makes it more 3D, pulls our attention into the sunset. Looks a whole lot better. Another one here, including those bushes at the top, just frames off the top of the shot. Check your backgrounds. This is my favorite tip from the entire course, actually. It's the easiest way to make your photos just look 10 times better without having to do any kind of complex theory or anything at all. The problem is, the human eye is really good at ignoring what's going on in the background of your photo. It's not until you get the picture back and then you'll be like, oh, really distracting element back there. It can completely ruin the shot. You know, the car coming out the back of the elephant, or it could be a, a power pole coming out of someone's head or a bright yellow car in the background that's just really distracting. But the thing is, it's like another whole level of consciousness you finally get to with your photography, where the background is just one of the things you remember to check. And you'll be like, doo -doo -doo, uh, background, oh wow, that's really awkward. If I just move a little bit to the side, you don't have a telegraph pole coming out of your head anymore, or whatever it is. Like this example with the lion, you know, the lion just blends in too much with the background. You know, it's the same color as the grass. But if you get down lower, you can get him against a bit of the sky and he just pops out there much nicer against that blue background. So what about this example? On Kangaroo Island, I was photographing these little birds on a stick and you kind of sneak up as close as you can get and you think that that's probably the best place to take the photo from. But look at the background behind the birds there. You've got blue, brown, green. No matter how good your lens is at blurring it out, it's still a really terrible background. The birds are dark and the, the background just behind them is dark and they all blend in. You can't really see them. You've got to look around and say, where can I find a nice clean contrasting color to use as a background here? What are our choices? Really, it's just the sky reflected onto the water, that nice blue color. That'd be fantastic. So you've somehow got to get that behind your subject. Could be a case of just getting a little higher, like tippy toe job. Or in this case, I actually had to walk slightly back up the riverbank, which seemed kind of counterintuitive because I had to walk further away. But then you can get the most amazing blue uniform background that just looks spectacular. Well, this one, an ant on a stick, that gray background there, that's just the road, like the asphalt on the road. But you can see there is a bit of a green glow to the side there. That's actually a leaf just out of shot. So if I move the camera about a centimeter to the right, you can end up with a green background, which looks so much more beautiful. Honestly, if you can just remember to glance into your background when you're taking a picture and just check if there's any distracting elements there, or if you can just turn a bit and get a cleaner contrasting color, it makes a world of difference to your photos. Fill the frame. Sometimes I think photos just could do with being cropped in a little bit tighter. People have this urge to try and fit everything in, all the extremities, and often the most important part, if you could just concentrate on that, it's a much more usable photo. Look at this one. That might be the way you're tempted to take the photo because you want to fit it all in, but actually that's probably better. In fact, that is a far better composition for the shot. We all know that yachts have a big pointy bit at the top and that's not what we're interested in this. It's just the interaction between the whale and the yacht. And now that we've zoomed in more, the subjects are bigger, 
It's more interesting, you can see the detail. It fits the rule of thirds. So we have the yacht on the top third intersection, whale on the bottom third, so they kind of balance there. Or this example, I was trying to keep swimming as far ahead of this lady as I could so I could turn around and, and get her all in shot. But you know, if you had to summarize that photo, you'd probably say that's a woman swimming with a blue starfish. But really, this is exactly the same thing, a woman swimming with a blue starfish. But it's a much simpler, cleaner sort of shot, and it's probably more usable. You, know, you could imagine that in a little brochure on a local dive resort or something. Not that she should be picking up starfish. But you know, compared to the other photo, there's just too much stuff going on there, too distracting. You're like, what is that yellow thing she's carrying? It's actually her shirt, but it looks like a bag. Is she stealing starfish? No, sometimes it's nicer to simplify your photo down just to the key parts, and they're often much more usable. Same with this one. I saw this lady walking down the street carrying a bunch of fish, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Get a photo of that. But then luckily, pretty quickly, I realized, hang on a second, what is actually interesting here? Pretty sure it's not her wonderfully happy expression or the fact that there's a tractor coming along. Oh, she's got no shoes on. Or there's power lines coming out of her shoulder. You know, you gotta think, what actually caught my attention here was the fact that she was carrying fish. So maybe if I zoomed in and just took a photo of fish carrying, it'd be a much more interesting shot. Even half the fish are cut out, but it doesn't matter. You can still tell they're fish. You can imagine a photo like that turning up in a little brochure about the local marketplace. Whereas that other photo, it's gonna go nowhere. Even a photo like this, you don't need to fit the whole thing in. You don't even need his whole head in there. It's still enough to tell that it's a beautiful shot of an elephant. It works quite strongly. So just try and remember, you don't always need to fit everything in. Crop in more, crop in tighter, often looks better. Leading lines. Now a leading line is any line coming into your photo from the outside, and it serves to guide your eye through the photo. Like this one. Your eye comes in along the railing and then he goes out to where the people are and you see that they're people and you gaze out along there and you see the rainbow and it all just ties together very neatly. Otherwise, some photos can just feel a bit disjoint. You have to kind of look around for a while and then go, oh, that's interesting. And oh, that's interesting over there as well. It's just not as smooth. If you can link things up with a line, it often looks better. Sure, you don't always have convenient leading lines around, but if you look for them, you can often find them. And if you do have a leading line, good tip is to make sure it comes in through the corner of your shot. Leading lines always look a lot more effective if they come in exactly from the corner. Anything but eye level. This composition tip is just saying, try not to take every single photo from just normal standing up height, because then everything always just looks the same. You know, getting up high or getting down low can be a way to just add a whole new angle of interest to a photo, a completely different perspective on an otherwise quite boring subject perhaps. You know, that's just a photo of Jess on a bike, not the most exciting subject in the world. But because it's taken from that really low vantage point, these are the kind of photos that stop you when you're flicking through a magazine because your brain basically goes, yeah, I know that that's a bike, but gee, that's, that's weird. Oh, it's taken from down. Oh, I get it. Same photo of a penguin taken at two different heights. You can really feel a different vibe in those two photos. One feels quite tall and regal. The other one feels like a little penguin shuffling around on the ground. At the very least though, if you're not trying to do some creative angle, you should always try to remember to get down to the same height as whatever it is you're photographing. So if you're photographing the, the family dog, get down to dog height or kids, because you otherwise just end up with photos where the kids are kind of having to look up into the photo and you feel very separated. So here's a photo of a gecko. Obviously that's taken down quite low, but it's not low enough. As soon as you get down to the same height as whatever it is you're photographing, you end up with a much more intimate connection there. and It's just a much stronger photo. And you can see this photo is also a good example of rule of thirds. That gecko's eye, the key bit, is in that top third intersection corner. And you can see how important it is to focus on the eyes as well. So you can see the front of his nose is blurry. Everything behind the eye, the rest of the body is completely blurry. Very thin depth of field. But because the eye is sharp, that's all that matters when you look at the photo. Look for details. That's part of the fun of being a photographer, I think. You start to spot little things that other people didn't even notice. And then when you get a photo of it, it's amazing. People just go, how did you even see that, let alone get a picture? It's very easy to get interesting photos if you start to look for the little details. You could just be walking through your garden or a jungle or something and find the way that beautiful little leaves have little curls on the end of them or raindrops on the back of a leaf or the way the spores grow on the back of a, a fern leaf. Feather details. We were out photographing Uluru a couple of years ago and you know, the sun went down and we got some nice photos and then we were just sort of thinking, what are we going to do now? And Jess actually spotted the reflection of Uluru in my eye, but she's got far more beautiful eyes than I do. So we swapped positions and I got a macro lens out and I took a photo of Uluru reflected in her eye. And people love this kind of photo. You know, technically it's a terrible photo. It's just about all blurry. But just because it's one of those little details that people go, wow, how did you even see that? That's a great shot. So keep your eye out for little details and textures and things like that. They can be good photos. 
Okay, you've got to remember to take some vertical photos as well. A lot of us just only ever take horizontal photos and that's a bit sad because some subjects just fit a vertical frame a whole lot better. Even long sweeping landscape shots like this one, you can still have a vertical version of that and it still works. Actually, when I went on my first Australian Geographic assignment, I was reading the contract points and one of them actually said, every single thing you photograph, you must take a horizontal and a vertical version of every single thing. And that blew me away. Often one of them might look better than the other, fair enough, but you can always take both and they always work. This one, the feeling is more, wow, what an amazing open view she has out that way. Wow, wouldn't that be incredible? And the other photo is a bit more like, oh, don't, don't stand so close to the edge. Your eye travels down the mountain and instead it feels taller. Now, if it feels awkward for you to take vertical photos, then that's a good sign that you're not taking enough of them. Maybe pretend you're on assignment for a while and next time you're taking a picture, force yourself to work out how to make it fit nice composition vertically. Take some of that as well. It'll just be good practice for you. And the last one, break these rules sometimes. You know, photography is a creative outlet. It's not like engineering where you've got your top 10 checklist and you better double check you've got every single one done. Otherwise the bridge is gonna fall down, you're gonna kill someone. You know, photography is fun, especially with digital. You can try all these different settings and weird angles that you're pretty sure aren't gonna work at all. But sometimes they do and you're like, that looks cool. I don't know, you might hate it. I don't mind it though. I can imagine it turning up in a magazine somewhere. But you know, I think it breaks every rule I can think of. The dog's eye is probably the key bit in the photo and that's in the dead center. There's no rule of thirds going on. Uh, it's probably about 30 degrees wonky. And I know I say, don't always try and fit everything in, but I wouldn't normally just cut off a third of someone's face and cut their toes off, but you know, it sometimes still works. So feel free to break these rules. It's really just there as a scapegoat. You know, if you failed on all nine of those other points, you can just say you're concentrating on the last one. <laughs> so in the next lecture, we're gonna look at exposure. You know, sometimes the photos are a bit too bright, a bit too dark. How do you fix that? Uh, histograms, that kind of thing. You start to learn a lot more, more advanced stuff. Mm -hmm.